Good Wednesday morning. On behalf of KPCC and Southern California Public Radio, welcome to the Crawford Family Forum. Today, in our Drucker Business Forum, we're talking about micro-businesses. They are a strong part of our economy and a major part of our lives. Please welcome our host, KPCC's business reporter, Ben Bergman, and his guests. All right, there you go. A second introduction. So, uh, so how many of you know what micro business is? All right, I, I didn't before I started this. So, because uh, we, we hear all the time about small business. Everyone talks about how great small business is. Small business drives our economy. But actually, small business is an incredibly broad term. It encompasses about 99% of all businesses because it's defined as any business with 500 or fewer employees. So that's a ton of business. Micro business is five or fewer employees uh, with about uh, 50,000 or less in, in capital. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, I'm going to give you a little pitch for microbiz, because it's actually, when you look at the stats for microbusinesses, it's rather astonishing. From 2004 to 2010, microbusiness created a net of five and a half million jobs. During that same period, the largest businesses lost 1.8 million jobs. And during 2009 and 2010, micro-businesses were the only firm size that created jobs. And the state with the most job gains in micro-businesses was California. And here, micro-businesses created 720,000 uh, 720, jobs. And uh, so we have a couple uh, examples here today of people who are running micro-businesses because they include the gamut of things from uh, sole proprietors to the people who come and fix your computers to the people you go to at the farmer's market. And we have um, examples here today. And I'm going to uh, give you the introductions. We begin with Adela Beltran, who has actually graduated from micro business to small business because she's been so successful. And Adela grew up in La Barca, Jalisco, where at the age of eight, she started running her family's small market. And at the age of 19, she came to the United States. She started off by sewing clothes as a factory. Then she started selling clothes. And after a few years, she saved up enough money to start her own business. She started a travel agency, a clothing boutique. And then she decided to go into the car business. She opened her own car dealership in East Los Angeles on Atlantic Street called American Auto Sales. But in the early 2000s, the county of LA actually issued an eminent domain on her dealership because they were building a school there. So uh, she kept going and started another dealership called Paramount Auto Center, which currently employs 15 people. So please welcome Adela. We also have Adam Small. Adam has been in the music business for over two decades. He started off as a bassist in New York City, and then he m moved into music licensing. And Adam recently started Adam Small Music, which is a music consulting and artist management agency. So please welcome Adam. And to my immediate left, we have Stacy Sanchez. She is a senior community loan officer with CDC Small Business Finance. And Stacy specializes in loans under $250,000. Stacy has been with the CDC Small Business Finance for a decade. And she's been working with small business owners for over 28 years. So uh, I'm sure she will be answering many of your questions today. She started her career with a family-owned business and spent a decade helping them grow. And she also serves on the board of Cameo, which is helping sponsor this event. And they have a lot of information outside. So uh, we're going to get started. And um, I think we should start asking uh, Stacy, uh, since you've worked with micro businesses for almost three decades. I explain what it is exactly you do, because I think a lot of people aren't fully aware of all the things that are available to them. Okay. Let me start with Cameo and um, explain who Cameo is, what we do, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Cameo is the California Association of Micro Enterprise Opportunities, and we're roughly 160 organizations throughout California that basically are dedicated to assisting micro businesses. 
Uh, we are technical assistance providers, coaches, like the small business development centers, women business centers, um, and we're small business lenders. Cameo is an advocacy group, so Cameo works to um, improve the climate for uh, our members as well as try to increase revenue, or excuse me, increase support, financial support for these organizations. Um, I work for a company called CDC Small Business Finance, and I'm in the Community Loan Programs Division, and we do make small business loans. We're a private nonprofit, and we make um, SBA loans under a program that allows non-bank lenders to make an SBA, what's called a 7A loan. We're also a, a, the nation's largest 504 lender, which is a particular product used for the purchase of like a building used primarily by small businesses, but we have made several building loans for micro businesses as well. Um, and I make loans under 250,000, as low as 5,000 throughout California, Arizona, and Nevada. So I, I explained uh, what you were telling me before, which is that pr after the crash, it's been pretty much impossible to get a, a micro business loan from a traditional bank. Yeah. Um, during the economic crash, when you know a lot of banks were under tremendous scrutiny, it didn't make as much financial sense for a lot of them to offer very small loans. So, you know, forty, fifty thousand seems you know it's a lot of money to you and me personally, but uh, for a bank or a financial institution, it's just a, it costs as much to put out a fifty thousand dollar loan as it does a five million dollar loan or a five hundred thousand dollar loan. And so, from the financial institution's point of view, it was not cost effective to put the resources into those small loans, as well as the additional scrutiny that they were under from the regulators. Um, about their uh, willingness to take risks on those types of loans. So in 2010, Obama's uh, Jobs Act created, um, one, an increase in the amount of funds that would be available to micro lenders, increasing micro loans from 35,000 to 50,000, and it created a program that allows uh, lenders like CDC to make 7A loans, SBA government guaranteed loans, up to 250,000. And right now, if you're a startup business or you've been in business for a couple years and you call your bank to see about a 70 or a 50 or a $40,000 loan, oftentimes they won't be able to help you simply because they just don't have a product to be able to offer you. And so how are the loans different uh, that you're providing? What, in how, many, how are the loans? You mean the ones we make the compared SBA to the SBA-backed loans from, from going to a bank. Is there any difference that people would notice? Oh, well, well, the rate. Um, so it's a better rate. Well, actually, ours is more expensive. It's okay. a better rate at the bank. <laughs> um, the SBA doesn't want nonprofits to be in competition with the financial institutions. I mean, you know, they have a, a long history, and it's a, uh, they're very key to the success of this SBA lending program. So these loans under 250000 that aren't available for the most part with financial institutions are going to be priced a little bit higher. So um, maybe 2 or 3 percentage higher overall. But otherwise, it's the same loan. I mean, the same product. And, and so, Adam, uh, you recently, when did you start your research? Consulting well, business. <clears throat> and hold the mic a little closer. For sure. The, um, the, the, my consulting business I recently started um, because it developed out of what I do naturally. But the loan that I got was for my music masterclass, which is um, I started a bit over a year ago. And I originally started it off a of Kickstarter, which is the American dream, right? So I raised $10,000 myself, and I knew that I had to build a product that um, I was able to show people what the worth was with the 10 grand. And um, I needed to be able to do everything myself uh, to get it to that point, because $10,000 isn't that much. So what I did is um, I built it to a point. Um, I, I built a website myself. Uh, I know how to do that. I learned um, because it was necessary. Um, did all the graphics, did everything myself, got it to a point where it was making money and it was launched. I hired some employees to get it all going. And then I got to the point where I knew I needed more funding. So either I was going to try to get partners or try to get a loan. And um, I was able to contact Stacy here um, after being rejected by a big bank. Uh, I won't name names. <laughs> since it's on you know, the interweb. Um, <clears throat> so I contacted Stacy, who basically 
saved me in terms of explaining what I really needed to do to get an SBA loan. Um, and it turned out that since I was in Los Angeles, she wasn't able to directly help me, and she still throwed me, threw me right in the right direction and gave me uh, a lead to a great bank that was able to get this process started. From there, and I hope I'm not taking up too much time no, here, <clears throat> I was referred to the PCR, and we will speak to Ella soon, I'm sure. Sorry about that, getting too close to the microphone. And um, the PCR was able to further help me um, with, they, ha they have a lot of divisions, and I'm sure Ellis will tell you about this later, but long story short, I was able to get a microloan of 60,000, um, and it's, it was great, and it was a very difficult process, even being as together as I was with all the business, but um, if you're able to get a loan like that, it means that you know the numbers make sense, um, the the business is moving in the right direction, and it's a it was a proud moment, and you know, and business has been good, so dreams can't come true. Well, it's interesting. Adam mentioned uh, Kickstarter, and I'm wondering, Stacy, whether you see a lot of businesses getting their if you can call it first round of funding through crowdfunding. Does that happen more? Uh, well, it happens more and more, but I don't see it as a regular occurrence still. Um, I talked to several people who maybe that's their best option for getting started, um, especially if they can start with you know, 10,000 or something like that. Um, and, d and just to kind of give everybody an idea, just in case, Kickstarter is, an, uh, is a crowdfunding source where you can go make a request, um, a presentation of what you're, why, why you're trying to raise the funds, and you typically have a time frame of which to raise those funds, and if you do raise them, then it's, it's free money. You don't have to pay it back. It's not a loan. It's a, it's a grant, so to speak. Uh, well, uh, yeah, and, and it's changed under the Jobs Act, too. You can now actually have investors through crowdfunding. Right, right. Uh, so I, I'm curious, uh, Adela, you Well, and, and please hold the mic for our listeners. Okay. The first thing I have, when I marriage my husband, we buy a house and we rent the house and I still live in with my parents. So I get a loan through my house because we were putting money to the principal to increase, you know, to have equity. When I refinanced my house, I got about 80,000 through my house. And plus I get a loan through the bank. At that time I got it through Bank of America when I started my business and was working like he said he mentioned I start my saw the beginning with one lad boy, one mechanic, me, you know. My husband is still working in the company he was working and and little by little I told him you need to leave the job because you need to help me. And he was his boss loved him so much he said no please help uh teach somebody so you don't leave me. So he was working like half a time and tried to help me. We was you know, little by little growing up and and then later on, you know, when the school has to make me move from that place, I was making so, ma so much uh, customer. Even I got customer from clothing that I had before, they're still looking for me. And, and I really appreciate them because they helped me to start growing my company, those customers. And then when the school make me move, I was so worried and, you know, I'm crying. I say, oh my God, I'm gonna lose my business. And uh, I was lucky to get that property. Uh, even the property was an escrow already in Downey, the one is Paramonado Center right now. And I was, uh, storage company has the property in, in, in escrow already. And um, I was with the city, please help me. I need to, I'm gonna lose my bin, I need to keep in business, you know, and I'm a resident of Downey, you need to help me. They say, we can do nothing there in escrow. You need to come to the meetings because the, the owner of the storage company, they want to buy the property just based on um, on the city let him to do the storage. But then I got an architect and I say, look, making a beautiful building. So I wanna go with the city and say, look, this is what I'm gonna put here in the city. And, I, and the architect says, 
Are you going to spend money? You not even have the property. I don't care. I want a hazard. Just make that build, you know, make a, like a graph or something to show them. So it's a beautiful, you know. So I convinced them to do it. So I went to the city and I showed them. They said, well, you need to come to the meeting. And then I went through Gia Loan, even without having the property. I went to Gia Loan through SBA, like a CDC. And I applied with them through Wells Fargo. They said, you need to get a bank. So we went and brought Wells Fargo and CDC. And they, I applied with them. and was working to approve me and everything. It takes like a... I would say six months, almost a year, you know, to try with the city, going to the meeting. So the storage company, he lose with one boat, and but he apply again. And he offered me, just to the next meeting, he offered me, oh, give me 100,000 and I let you take the, the property. And I say, no, this is gonna yours, it's gonna be mine, it's gonna be mine, it's gonna be yours, it's gonna be yours, because I thought, well, the money's gonna help me for the building, so I was praying God, you know, I have so much faith in God, and I said, yeah, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like it's going to be mine. So we went to the meeting again, but I already was approved. The band make the, you know, the, you know, they make a property like um, survey, the prop mm -hmm. I mean, survey of the property. So, I mean, everything was ready, you know, but, but I don't have the property in my hands, it's the storage company in escrow. So we went to the meeting, finally, and I was trying to go with all the city, please, I need help, please. And I said, well, go to the meeting. We went to the meeting, and they denied him. So I go with the owner, it was Mr. Fever. Was a very, he, he owns Paramount Chevrolet in Downey. Mm -hmm. That place, he used to be a Paramount Chevrolet and franchise in that place. So I went through him and I said, please, I want you, they deny him, I want you to sell me the property. He said, well, I don't want to wait until you go through the city and make, you know, until they approve you to make a dealer there. They go, no, don't worry. Let's go to open Oscar. I'm ready. So <laughs> we went to Oscar, we opened, I was ready, you know. And then I called to the bank, and the bank, you know, talked to them, they yes, I'm already approved. So we opened Oscar, and Thank God, you know? Yeah. I'm in business and a beautiful business. And well, well uh, let me ask you, Stacy, because you've probably seen so many micro businesses over the years succeed or fail. Uh, and and I, we probably have a lot of owners here today uh, of micro businesses. What is the single biggest piece of advice that you would give them? Get help. Um, seek coaching. Uh, we think at Cameo, we think that that's what will drive your success. Over 80% of businesses that do seek help are successful and are more likely to continue to grow and create new jobs as opposed to those that don't and are um, more likely to fail. Um, that, so that would be my biggest advice. Get help. And you pay for help, you don't realize it, with your tax dollars. The Small Business Development Center, the Women's Business Centers provide free one-on-one -on -one coaching and that their services are funded by your tax dollars. And, and Adam, since you have just started your business, gone through that process, what advice do you have for someone just starting out? What was the mistake that you made that you, you wish other people wouldn't have? Um, well, I also agree with get help. My wife is a mental health therapist, and you know, <laughs> um, no, but <clears throat> she is. But you know, that's not the joke. Um, I I think that I mean I feel I feel that I did the most of. I don't have any regrets about what I did, but I I do think that the most important things about starting your own business are, to me, and maybe this is just because what I did is really understanding the field you're getting into. Um, not just saying, hey, I like food. I see that there's an awesome restaurant nearby. Let me get into the restaurant business. Have you ever worked as a chef? Have you ever worked in the front of house? Um, I know my business. I know my clientele. And I also knew that there was a product out there that didn't exist. So for me, it was an obvious choice. I researched a lot. And if you're trying to get a loan, that really matters. Um, the stuff that I had to give to the people, um, or give to the government, I mean the, the SBA loans. Um, I had a, 
think about this. Um, why are you better than another company? Um, and not just you telling me why. Um, I need math, right? So I had to go online and find out not only my demographic in order to get this loan, how many people, for instance, I, um, I offer music education videos for professional musicians. So I, I film professional musicians, music lawyers, all kinds of professionals that help musicians become professional musicians. Okay, if that makes sense. Now, I had to find out my demographic, so I had to find out all the people in America that are majoring in music. Maybe that's something creatively I would think about so that I can sell that to the bank and say, hey, look, look, these are all the people that are interested in higher education in music. How many people like online music education? Maybe that's another number. Um, how many people are in different societies? How many people do Google searches? You can find out from Google AdWords or uh, keyword searches. How many people search for certain things every month? You can see the amount. All these numbers make sense. Not only will it help you target your demographic and really hone what you're doing, but it'll also help you get a loan because it convinces people that don't care about you, and this brings me to my other point, is that you can't take it too personally. Like, uh, especially me being a freelancer my entire life, you have to be, you're a business. If someone rejects me, they're not rejecting me personally. I might be a great person, and it doesn't matter, right? It's just a business. And when a bank looks at your proposal, when they look at your business plan and your, your numbers, it's math and it's risk. So, hey, no, I'm just kidding. Um, um, and it's risk, so you want to make sure that um, what you're showing is bulletproof because you're going to have people asking you that aren't your friends and family. They're going to say, well, why is this going to work? How are you different than um, this other company? Um, and you have to be able to back it up with math. And it has to be airtight because their, their job is to knock it down. And I'm not saying that they don't want you to succeed, but again, that's my advice. And, and I'm grateful that I, I took all those precautions. But that was the biggest thing I learned from the process was just making it an airtight proposition to a business person that cares nothing about you personally. And you, you want to have that pitch ready before you walk in to see someone like Stacy. Yeah, all of Stacy's awesome. Yeah, she's not going <laughs> to make you cry. Ad, uh, um, and uh, Adela, you've run business since, since you were eight years old. Oh, well, yeah. What is the biggest piece of advice you would give to micro business owners? One, just to be um, passion, one thing, and the business. One other secret is to be passion that you. You, you don't make money at this time, but you need to be patient and strong and keep going. Never give up. Always, no, no, don't, don't limit your time. Never. If you limit your time, you're not going to be successful. That's not one of the secrets in business. You know, you have to be strong and, and positive always. Never be, never. Always find solutions. You have, a, oh, we can do this. Yeah, we can do it. There is many things always people say, even banks. I send my loans through them. They say, oh, no, I can't do it. And I go, hmm, they don't want it. So I talk to them again. I say, look at this. Look at this credit. Look at this uh, account. Look at the I had to even talk to them to share about, to talk about the credit, you know, to make something positive. And they let us say, oh, OK, I'm going to prove it to you. See, always we need to do it. Even the bank say, I see this deal before, like a, three days ago. I mean. They go, yeah, but look, it's, you have, come on, this is a, a deal. I know this looks, I talked to the person, looks really honest person, he's going to pay you, give him the chance. And thank God that's what I'm business, you know, because we had to be percent, come on, Pers persistent. persistent, persistent. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> well, and, and I'm going to introduce uh, a fourth member of our panel, Ellis Gordon, who was a last uh, minute edition. He's a business advisor at the Small Business Development Center. And uh, Ellis, what is the single biggest piece of advice that you would give micro businesses starting out? Oh, you know, okay. Uh, what I, as as uh, as Stacy said earlier, uh, get help. I think the key is that the Small Business Development Center is probably the best kept secret in uh, in the country because it's free. All you have to do is go through a one-hour orientation, and then uh, 
they provide counseling for you. My background is uh, finance. I'm a recovering banker. I'm in step six <laughs> of the 12-step program. But we have advisors that, uh, like for instance, with, with Adam. Adam met with a social media advisor. We have a legal advisor. We have uh, marketing advisors. And it just so happens that uh, a Pacific Coast regional uh, area is this particular area. We, we go from Huntington, uh, Park on the south to the San Gabriel Valley on the uh, on the north, and I happen to be here on Monday in Pasadena at the uh, at the EDD Center, which is at, on on Green Avenue. So again, the services are there. Make use of it. You've got people that uh, have been around for a while that have expertise in certain areas, and they can help you to put your business together. And Ellis, what you you what is the single biggest thing that people come to you for coaching? Everybody wants money. Okay, that's not that's, a surprise. That's the, the biggest thing. And the, the misnomer is that they say, well, I want some of that Obama money. And I say, well, when you <laughs> find it, let me know, because I want some too. Yes. Uh, but what we do is that we, if you are not bankable at the time you come into the center, what we do is work with you to get you to the point where you are bankable. We cannot finance everybody that comes in. But rather than say no and send you away, we say, okay, these are the steps you need to make in order to get to the point where you can become bankable. Yes, go ahead. I just want to jump in that bankable could also mean that you could become eligible for like a SBA microloan. Um, SBA microloans are made by nonprofit organizations and they go from typically 5,000 to 50,000. Um, and the individual organization within, a, within you know, a certain guidelines sets their own lending criteria. And those loans have a required technical assistance. So if you get the loan, you're required to meet with a consultant one-on-one -on -one for at least six sessions post-loan. Um, because again, SBA recognizes that that coaching component is really key to the success of a business. But um, there are several nonprofit organizations throughout California and the United States that make SBA microloans. They're typically regionally restricted because as a community-based lender, it's important to know your area, and that's real key in making a successful microloan. And I, I talked at the top about how microbusiness relates to unemployment. Part of that is sole proprietors and people after they've lost their jobs, especially over 50, going out and instead of getting another job for whatever reasons, starting their own business. And Stacy, you actually have firsthand experience with that. I do. Well, you know, I, let me just, Cameo really believes that micro enterprise are the job creators, just like you said at the beginning, the number of jobs. And it's a trend that we see as a labor market trend in that um, as unemployment continues to not go away or uh, increase or decrease, um, more and more people are starting their own business. My husband recently lost his job of 27 years and um, has spent this year looking for work and he's what AARP calls an encore entrepreneur. This is somebody like who's term. over 50 and is off on a new um, career endeavor, right? So he's basically, we're gonna start a business for him or start a business and in doing so we will create a job for him. So yeah, it's a perfect example of what we're seeing out there with entrepreneurs or individuals who for one reason or another um, are not able to uh, get em employment or who choose to you know, encore their career opportunities and do something else. And uh, I mean, are, what are the unique challenges of, of that? I would think. Well, you know, I thought it would be really easy because you know, I've been doing this for 20, almost 30 years and well, it's, it is, there's just so many moving parts at the beginning, you know, your corporate, well, we formed a corporation, but the formation, your insurance and banking and, you know, where you get your permits and, oh, does the health department have something to say about this? And, oh, does the water department, I mean, just, I was really amazed at the number of, of items that need to be taken care of. And, you know, we're, we've been working at it for a month and we're still not open, you know, so. <laughs> And, and so, I mean, we've talked quite a bit about financing, which understandably is the most important issue. Um, what are some of the other things that, that you see small m micro businesses having trouble starting out with? Is it uh, they don't know how to market or they don't know how to deal with all the regulations or what are other key elements? Accounting. Accounting is always a, can be um, a 
problem for some businesses. You know, somebody may have a what sounds like a great concept, and I can see, or they, it sounds like they've got some good clients. They're starting to make some money, but maybe they are doing their own books, and they've not met with an accountant, or um, maybe got bad advice. But I don't see it on their financials, and so it's not enough for you to tell me that you're making money. I need to see it on the financial statements. I need to see it on your tax returns, and sometimes. You know, we have a tax strategy to not pay tax, any income taxes, and as a result, maybe we don't report all our income or we expense it out, and, and they don't benefit from um, the accounting practices that they're engaging in. Again, you know, pushing coaching and the importance of, of seeking assistance. And, and so for Adam, I'm curious for you, uh, what was uh, a challenge in when you move from musician to small business owner, which very different skill set, what's it, an, an, another challenge you faced? You have to wake up before 3 p.m., which is very <laughs> difficult. Yes, you're here at 9.09 <laughs> a.m. No drinking past midnight. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, um, that's the stereotype, by the way. Huh? Okay. Um, so accounting, absolutely. Um, as a freelancer, and I don't believe it's just as a musician, um, you get this kind of... Uh, would it be like hand and mouth thing going where uh, you, st you start, I mean, I started at, you know, 19 years old as a full-time musician and, you know, eating beans and rice and doing it like that. And you get into this habit when you're always a freelancer. I don't know if this is true for um, people that have corporate jobs and then move into their own thing. But um, you get into this kind of, do I have enough to pay rent? That's all that matters. And this is, it's a very myopic tunnel vision. You get this tunnel vision of, do I have enough for what I need? And you don't really ever account for savings or you don't account for doing everything the correct way. You just know that you have enough money to accomplish a job. So that is something that's grown with me as I've done more business over the years and I've learned how to you know, account for my books and I do everything properly. So I think as a freelancer, you have to understand that if you think something's gonna cost a certain amount, you really have to map it out. And the, even the process, like I was saying before, of proposing to a bank, it really helps you pull that off. So I would suggest making a business plan, um, even if you're not applying for a loan, just so you could actually see what your projections are. Like, did you account for your internet uh, your internet bill, your um, how much your web host costs um, a year, how much um, it costs if you have to travel, and your gas. Like these little things are small, but not if a, a tank of gas costs fifty dollars, right? So these actually do add in. It's not just like, oh, I got a business, like I'm selling CDs. It costs this much to make CDs. Like, how much time does it take you to um, create this? How much time does it? Do you need to hire people? So, I think that's accounting is huge. Um, I think the other things that are really, really important is utilizing the technology around you. Some people are reluctant to, um, I'm a big tech geek, so um, I, like I said before, I built my own website and um, you know, one of the things I do feel is really important is um, understanding everything that goes into your business um, until you need help um, and you should always ask for it. And, there's many organizations, or at least two amazing ones right here today. Um, but you should know how to do things so you can hire the right people. So if you uh, are making a website, you should understand exactly what you need. And if you have a little time, research, go learn how to make a WordPress site. It's not that hard. You can read about it online. Um, learn Photoshop to make uh, flyers or Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator. Just learn little programs. There's all kinds of things you can learn. There's tutorials online. Um, this software will help you because if you're hiring a graphics designer every time you need to make a flyer, it's going to cost a thousand dollars. If you need a website, someone to make your website, it could cost five grand. Or you could take maybe 20 hours of training and try to make it yourself and then get help on the finishing touches. Even if you don't end up being a web builder like I ended up learning how to be, um, you'd still be able to monitor someone doing the job and make sure they're not taking you for a ride. It's just like going to an auto mechanic and not knowing anything about cars. You don't know what they're going to charge you for. You have to go to someone reputable, and you don't want to be in that position where you're not in the know. So those things are really, really important to me. Um, and 
you know, I'm, I'm sure I could list a lot more, but, you know, I, I, I do believe that, and, and again, to just to sum up what I just said, you have to know when to ask for help. Um, when I need a lawyer, I hire a lawyer. All right, don't try to pretend like you're, you know, get like a contract from the 90s, like I see people, because I've also done a lot of uh, licensing for film and TV with my music, and I have a lot of music on shows. And I've seen people that send me contracts, and they're always, 90% of the time, you can tell there's a lawyer on staff. And then once in a while, I'll get something that mentions VHS and like all this stuff in there. And I'm like, I could tell this is just one of those free templates you get online, like I know right now that I have the upper hand in negotiations because you don't have a lawyer. So I could just get back to you and say, hey, you know, I need a revision on this clause here. And I know they're just going to stumble. So don't put yourself in a position where you look like an amateur. And um, don't put, it, put yourself in a position where you'd be legally liable for something. Enough said, I think. Good advice. Well, I, I, I certainly have more questions, but I also do want to open it up to our audience because that's sort of the main point is to get all your questions answered, which you can do individually afterwards, but hopefully you also have some questions which would interest the whole group. So please, if you have uh, questions for any one of our four panelists, uh, raise your hand and uh, someone will come over to you with a microphone. Yes, we have a question there in the back row and please introduce uh, yourself, hi. sir, and wait for the microphone. Hi, there you go. You? Chopin at Tessari. Uh, Stacy, just curious, when you mentioned rates, um, what are the rates that are offered for these micro business loans? Um, SBA micro loans are the interest rates would be set by the individual micro lender. We're all pretty competitive at pro we at CDC Small Business Finance right now our micro loan rates. This is five to fifty thousand are fixed at eight percent, and the loan is amortized for five years. That means you have five years to pay the the loan back. Under the SBA seven A loan program, which is the SBA's umbrella product, the one you hear most often about at a financial institution or in the news. Um, those amortization terms vary depending on the use of proceeds. So equipment might be 10 years, working capital is typically seven years. And those interest rates at a bank are capped at prime, which is at three and a quarter right now, plus two and three quarters. So the maximum interest rate a financial institution can charge you at, for an SBA 7A loan is prime plus two and three quarters. Under the loan program that um, we make uh, 7A loans under, which is called Community Advantage, and it's a pilot loan program, non-bank lenders make SBA 7A loans at prime plus two and three quarters up to prime plus six. Woo! So that's a little bit more of a risky loan when you're making something at prime plus six. Um, our average is about prime plus three and a quarter, three and a half. Um, they are typically secure, SBA has a requirement that you must take whatever collateral is available up to 100% of the loan amount. So depending on the type of loan or the status of your business will determine the amount of security that we would require. So basically if it's projections based, meaning that I don't see from your previous year's tax return that you have the ability to make the loan payment, then yes, we will be looking for some collateral to support your request because you're saying, if I get the money, this is what you can expect me to accomplish. As opposed to a, what's called a historical cash flow loan, where I look at your previous year's tax returns and I can see that the business and or yourself as an individual has the ability to make the loan payment. Then we have a little bit more flexibility as to the value of the collateral that would be required. And I wanted to stress that most lenders rely on the tax returns as opposed to what you produce internally QuickBooks this year because it's a sworn statement, it's a felony to lie to the federal government. Whereas, you know, the interim QuickBooks that you give me, you know, at the end of the year it could just be a, oops, I made a mistake. Um, so that's why lenders really want to rely on the tax returns. Other questions? Yes, we have one over here. Uh, please wait for the microphone for our audience at home. Hi, this message, this, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. Uh, this question is both for Adela and Adam. I'm very curious to know how you built your clientele. Um, what did you do as far as marketing to bring in uh, the volume you needed? So 
in terms of marketing, there there was a bunch of things I did, and I did a lot of it um, technologically because I knew that I could do it affordably, and I knew how to how to pull that off. So, the first thing that I was able to do was with Facebook, which everyone is heard of. No, all right. <laughs> think that they made a few bucks. So Facebook, you can make a Facebook page, but it's not good enough just to make a Facebook page. And I'm going to I'm going to like overview this pretty quickly, but <clears throat> this is all important stuff. Not only doesn't it look good if you make a Facebook page, not like a personal page but the business page that doesn't have a lot of l likes. Not only doesn't that look good, but it also doesn't help you. So you want to get your likes to at least over a thousand and you want to keep going. I think our page has a, almost 5,000 at this point. Um, but you can do it with Facebook ads. And you can do that for $5 a day. You can do it for $3 a day. You can pause your campaigns whenever you want. Um, so, and, and maybe, and this also has to do with my business. I have an online business. It might not always be the same um, you know, with, with a physical car dealership. So I'm speaking to myself about myself now. Um, so. You can use Facebook ads. You can target everything from demographic. Think about the information Facebook has, right? So it's it's very it's scary. It's almost Big Brother, right? I mean, they have they know what movies you've liked, what school you went to, uh, what year you graduated, if you're male or female, obviously, um, who your friends are, uh, what you post about. So as a person making an ad, you can target all that. You can say looking for interest, uh, Berkeley College of Music graduated from here to here, interested in Art Tatum, uh, Thelonious Monk, and Kesha. Well, that would be a very bizarre person, by the way. <laughs> so I start doing that. These are the people I want to target. I want to target this, this campaign for $3 a day. I can also target by region, OK? You can do the same thing with Google AdWords, OK? So you can do your Google Ads. And um, you do the same kind of things. Of course, Google also has a lot of information about us, right? Not only do a lot of us have Gmail, it knows what we search for. Um, hell, you know, you, there's a lot involved here. You can do the exact same thing. Target regions, people, demographics, search terms. You can say, if someone searches for flowers and Lo Los Angeles, I want my florist to come up. Okay, You do that. You look up Google AdWords. That's another way to do it. Twitter, um, unfortunately, you know, I, I didn't grow up in a Twitter generation, but now I, I do it. You have to do it. Um, I have, we have a bunch of Twitter followers, almost 5,000, I guess. Um, oh no, we have over 6,000. Good. Um, keep active with all this stuff. You can't just make a social media page and post once a week. You have to post daily. You have to, even if it's just, and don't always sell yourself. Um, sell yourself 30% of the time. Um, write stuff that helps people 70% of the time. If you're a florist, write about gardening, write about news stories, write about this, then put your promotions in. Don't just come across, like if people don't, if, if a telemarketer calls you, you're gonna hang up. If someone calls you and they start talking to you, you might talk to them for a little bit. Then they try to sell you at the end. That's what a good salesman does. Um, you don't wanna be, no one wants to look at a page that's just giving them coupons or telling them that they need Viagra or, or whatever it is. Um, you have to be a social media presence that helps people. And then you put your thing in there, okay? Um, those are ways we got out. Um, I also target people in schools. Um, I do speaking engagements where I'm gonna be speaking at the University of New Haven when I go back to New York in a week um, for the music industry conference to help people. And I've loved help people and you have to wanna do that. If you can do that and be an expert in your field, it'll draw more attention to yourself as well. But it, you have to, you can't just fake it, you know, and just try to sell your product. Like I like helping people, it's gonna work out because people will understand and trust your brand. Um, I'm sure I could go on further about this, but I, I'd be interested to see your methods as well. Well, mine is different in the past because in the past we don't have internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's very different from right now. Right now I have all internet, where's come, um, uh, auto trader, I have, we can do Craigslist too. But in the past was very different than now. The past, first of all, I have customers for clothing, which has helped me a lot because I call them. I, I make a little room display to say, look, I'm still with my business. Come here. I'm selling cars. So I start with them. The 
the good thing in business, we had to do to be really honest because my my business grew up with a lot of referrals in the past because we didn't have internet. I started over 20 years ago. So it's really good to be very honest with the person. And um, even like my warranty was 30 days and the customers come after three days or two months and I still have them with the mechanic. You know, it's very important to keep the relationship with the customers. And is that still important with, with Yelp and things like that? Yeah, it's very important always to um, customer service, you know, always to be, because he's the one give us the business, the customer. Customer is, you know, priority and not the business. You know, it's the priority thing, is the customer. I leave everything. I don't care if the customer call me about 10, 11, oh my, I get stuck. Like me, I never put time, I never put a schedule in my job, in my business, never. For me, it's not a schedule. For me, it's Priority is the business, you know? So this is, right now I have, um, but that time was a lot of referrals. Even the, I sent them to the insurance company, the insurance company said, all oh, your customers come and they say, oh, my cars get really good and never break down. Because what I do, I told the mechanic, check everything in the car, please. I always very strict with him. Check everything in the car. I don't want the customers to come and call me, you know, because I want, you know, the customer said, oh, the store sells, you know, really good cars. And that's how I grew up. I make so much customers. I was so blessed. And even when the school moved me, make me move, say, how this small company can do so much because I show my tax return, you know? They say, wow, because how, this small company, how do you do it? Because they have another company next door, they don't do this that much as me, you know? Yeah. And that's right. very important. Yeah. Other questions? We, uh, yes, uh, we have a, a bunch. So, uh, yes, sir, uh, here, or, or uh, since the microphone is over here, let's go to this gentleman on the aisle. We'll come to you next. Uh, <coughs> referencing uh, what Adam was saying, but directing it toward Alice and Stacy, being uh, uh, recently paradigm shift corporate America into now an encorepreneur, so to speak. What consulting do you guys have toward technology? I know you have traditional consulting for accounting, advertising, and such and such, but the new, you know, buzzword, the AdWords, the Google, right. what do you have for small business owners like ourselves. Most of the, you'll find that um, all the small business development centers throughout California or throughout the nation or the women's business centers, um, which also serve men. I, I know it's, it's called the women's business center, but um, they have various specialties. Like they have a social media expert at P uh, Pacific Coast Regional. Uh, here in Los Angeles, Pace is another provider, and they, I know, do some social media uh, workshops, um, setting up your LinkedIn. I mean, some of them will be very specific to a particular site, and then others will be more in general, how do you get going in social media? So uh, procurement online, government contracting online, certifications that you can get online. Typically, every center or um, consulting center has some sort of expertise uh, in those various areas. And Ellis also wanted to uh, answer that briefly. I guess what I wanted to say also are two points that Adam made earlier. I think that's important. The first thing that you need to do is to do a business plan because what a business plan is is taking ideas and concepts out of your head and put them on paper so you can look at it dispassionately and you can determine whether this makes sense or not. Like a lot of times if you have a great idea in your head, you put it on paper, it doesn't make any sense at all. Conversely, you put it on paper, you say, why didn't I do this six months ago? And I think it's important also, another point that that Adam made was research. You've got to determine what your market is. You can't just say, I'm going into a $100 billion market and I'm going to get 100 or 1% of that. Why? I mean, how are you going to do that? And I think it's important to understand that. And back to your point about uh, the technology side of it, we do have a social media person at, at PCR. We also help people to get certifications and make them aware of the different certifications that are out there so that you can take advantage of government contracting as well. All right, uh, quite a, qu I, I, yeah, just uh, briefly, because we have a bunch of other questions. Um, and Sahar at um, PCR is also helping me, I forgot to mention this, 
um, with LinkedIn and search engine optimization, which is huge. Yeah, SEO. Okay. Other, uh, looks like we have a bunch of questions. Uh, yes, uh, it's this gentleman over here on the uh, aisle, I promise to call on. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Marco, and the question is for Stacy and for Mr. Uh, Gordon. Um, he just mentioned something about research, um, and I know it's a very, uh, maybe a vague question, but h how do you, like if you just can't find a piece of info, like he said, like the number of people who do this or that, or you just want numbers and you can't find them, um, what would you suggest, uh, where can you go, what do you do? You know, Ellis might be able to answer this, but I know that some of the centers that I've worked for have access to certain software or sites where they may be able to pull some information down that you might not have access to just in a general Google search of sorts. Uh, well, also, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the county of Los Angeles, there is an organization called Los Angeles Economic Development Corporation, and it does uh, industry studies for not only this county, but several other counties, and you can go onto their website, which I think is ledc.org, and gather information about the industry that you want to go into. If you cannot find specific information about the industry you want to go into, one of the things that the SBDC has is that they've got a national network, and we can do some research for you also to try to drill down to exactly what it is you need to have and see whether we can uh, get that information to you so that it can help you to make a decision as to uh, how you want to proceed. All right, are there, are we have time for just a few more questions. Uh, yes, ma'am, right? Uh, just Yes, hi. Um, I wanted to ask you, when looking at a microloan, is it credit driven? And also, um, the type of businesses that are um, you know, applying, are they only B to C type businesses or also B to B type businesses? So, and if it is credit score driven, what are we looking at minimum wise? Um, all types of businesses, business to business, business to public, I mean, doesn't, matter there's not a restriction on that um, as far as your personal credit all most lenders or all lenders look at what are called the five C's of credit sometimes they'll call them three C's or two C's but they're looking at your character um, your past record and or your ability to manage the business your personal credit and the personal credit of anybody who owns 20% or more. They're looking at capital, the amount of capital that you've invested into the business, your skin in the game, so to speak. Cash flow, the ability of your, your, you, you as an individual or the business primarily to service the loan. And then collateral, what's the exit strategy for the, biz, for the lender if you don't hit your projections or don't achieve your goals. As far as the personal credit goes, really what most lenders are looking for is not so much a, a score, although some will have a minimum, 640, 650 is a pretty common minimum, but um, they're looking primarily that you're current on your accounts. If you don't have that score due to maybe you don't have a lot of accounts to drive that score up, they're looking to see are you making your payments on time. If you are not making your payments on time, then the lender is going to automatically assume that you will treat them the same. So however you've handled your contractual obligations on your credit is a reflection of your character and or how you'll handle the, the new loan. So it is credit driven in that it, it, it gives a record of your history of how you handle those types of things. Um, but it doesn't, it's not the sole factor in determining whether or not you qualify, especially when you're talking about micro lenders. Ellis, did you want to add to that? Uh, I, I think it's important to understand that if, if a banker or a bank does not know you, the only way they can judge your character is by looking at your credit score. If your credit is bad enough to carry two guns and an Uzi, it's going to be difficult for them to uh, make you a loan. But it, the credit score really does talk about character. Like, for instance, I've had, when I was in banking, people would come in and say, I didn't pay that bank, but I'm going to pay you. And I said, okay. <laughs> so, I, I, so it's important. And there are a lot of things you can do. If there are things, I would say what you should do is that you can get a free credit report by law. Uh, and there are three major agencies. So rather than get them all at one time, what you can do is get, get a credit report every quarter and just see what your credit looks like. My philosophy is dispute everything. Because if worse comes to worse, they'll, they'll say, yes, you do owe it. But in a lot of cases, things will fall between the cracks, or maybe it's not yours. So you, should, you have to fight to make sure that your credit is uh, good, because it really shows the bank or the banker what your character is. 
I right. like people to think of their credit as an asset and that you need to protect it and nurture it just like you would the home that you purchased that's an asset you maintain it you keep up on it you you, you keep records same thing with your credit it's an asset and it will make a it will affect what you pay for loans on cars homes your child's education i mean it's it's a it's a major factor in how um, capital is is handed out in this country one last question uh Yes, right over here. Hi, my name's Lauren Mahoney. Um, this is for Ms. Sanchez and Mr. Gordon. Um, we have a really interesting comparison between a more traditional business and a more tech-focused uh, business. I was wondering if you could speak to um, when you're having small businesses come into you, what are you recommending and what are you seeing them using in terms of marketing practices? Is it tech-based or is it still more person-to-person -person interactions? Ellis is probably going to be able to answer this a little bit better. I see in, my client, in the clients that come apply for loans a variety of it. It's still one-on-one. -on -one, it's still reliance on word of mouth, and sometimes that word of mouth is also tech-based. Um, but they're using traditional as well as new marketing technology. I couldn't say that one is. Yes. Uh I'll piggyback on that. It, it really depends upon what, what type of industry you're going into or the type of business you're doing. I mean, some businesses require, it's like, for instance, an admin business, he, he can do everything uh, based on technology. But as, as you look at Adela's business, it's more hands-on customer service, people that have been with her in the clothing industry that are now coming to her to get their car fixed because they like what she did in the clothing industry. So it really depends upon the industry that you're going to be involved in. And I think you need to employ all of the different uh, methods. All right, well, we're going to uh, wrap up the official part of our panel. I'd like to thank all of our panelists uh, so much for uh, coming and also uh, Janice for producing this event. Please come back to the Crawford Family Forum, particularly the Drucker Business Forum. We have lots of events coming up, so I uh, hope you'll come back. And our panelists, I think, can all stick around for a little bit. So if you have questions, by all means, go up to them. But thank you very much for coming.